So now we are uh, live on our uh, Facebook platform. Uh, thank you, dear and uh, respected friend. Thank you so much for your kind participation in today's uh, Swadhyay Sachak Weekly Dialogue. So let's uh, start uh, today's session with an invocation of song. So let me just share the screen, please. Say instrumental music. Thank you so much for your uh, kind uh, attention. Uh, dear and respected friend, for uh, Sonal and Dhir Kumar Gautam on behalf of Vishwanitan Center for Asian Blossoming, welcome you to attend today's Swadhyay Sachakra Weekly Dialogue. The topic of today's dialogue is the Tamil idea of education, the Tinai model. We have with us Professor Nirmal Salvamani, who is a former professor of English and a deep seeker from Central University of Tamil Nadu. We welcome you, sir. We welcome Professor Anand Kumar Giri from Madras Institute of Development Studies as a moderator of today's session. And I will, we welcome Professor 
Mohanti, uh, Professor uh, Miraj, uh, Miniti Pradhanji, Professor Gyan Gului, MD Chandar Sahab, and all friends co present here. Uh, let me give you a brief introduction to our speaker, Professor Nirmal Salvamani. Uh, for our circle, he is a well known. He always uh, helps us with his deep understanding of literature, music, and philosophy. He is a former professor and nurturer of Department of uh, English Studies and Dean School of Social Science and Humanities at uh, Central University of Tamil Nadu. And uh, he has a unique orientation towards literature, English. He's a good teacher and uh, he's a good writer. He has published more than nine books and more than uh, 50 books, chapters, and uh, many journals, articles. Uh, uh, he has conceived a unique kind of idea called uh, Tenai, and uh, he's working in this, uh, uh, particularly in this uh, idea of Tenai from uh, 1980. In fact, he launched the first uh, discussion group uh, in the early 1980s, and he called Tenai Movement. Uh, he also introduced a, an uh, ecocentricism course in uh, ecocriticism course in India and uh, founded a forum named Tinai. Uh, he also promoted uh, the theory of new Tinai voices, uh, revived the philosophy of Tinai society. Uh, which um, had been in a state of limbo uh, for more than a thousand years. And uh, he has also deep interest in music. And uh, he has developed a new area of a study called uh, Tinai uh, Musicology. And uh, he has a scripted and directed plays and also played a guitar in professional bands. So uh, uh, today uh, we will understand his uh, uh, idea of Tinai. And uh, 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 our circle called uh, Swadhyay Sarchan, uh, which is a circle of co-learning and mutual studies, which is a part of Vishwanidhan Center for Asian Blossoming Trust. And uh, we uh, we organize uh, uh, event uh, online discussion in every uh, Sunday or sometimes on uh, Wednesday also. Uh, the study seekers such as Sri Arvindo, Mahatma Gandhi, Chitranjan Das, a creative soul from Orissa, and many others from around the world. Uh, we also present our own writings and reflect our creativity together. Uh, we also invite seekers from different fields of life uh, to share their knowledge, uh, visions, sadhana, and a struggle for creating a world of beauty, dignity, and dialogue. Uh, so first, I would like to invite uh, Ananda Bhai uh, to give a kind of brief introduction of the theme, and then we'll invite uh, respected Professor Nirman Salvaman. Yes, Ananda Bhai. So thank you, dear Andir, and thank you, uh, Nirmal, and all friends. So it is a joy to be with Professor Nirmal Selbamani and to learn about the Tinai idea of education. And as Tinai is a multidimensional way of being with our different topographies, different layers of existence, so that is so central to education. Education is rooted to the roots where we are. At the same time, it crisscrosses with many routes. 
so our idea of being human our idea of belonging to our mother earth is with the tinai the soil that we are born together with and all over the world there is this creative regeneration of soil based education and tagore uh, and as uh, today i am with you from near santiniketan and as santiniketan was established as an ashram in 1901 and that significance of this place when tagore had come from here to kolkata and uh, he felt the the power of the place a kind of energy which drew him so that is the idea of you know the significance of a place and also in this education we would uh, hear from professor selvamani about the idea of logic and the tamil idea of logic as it in tulakappam because this different ways of reasoning is very important and uh, education must also prepare us for different ways of reasoning so with joy we look forward to be nurtured by professor selvamani today and as i am on the road so i would listen to all of you and after professor selvamani i request anvi to kindly <laughs> nurture the discussion thank you yes is professor nirmal selvamani over to you thank you very much thank you uh, ananta mr randeer uh, ms minati and others very good evening to all of you uh, can you see me and hear me yes yes yeah thank you very much so the title as uh, mr randeer already told you is the tamil idea of education the tinai model for the past few months tamil scholars have been deliberating on the possibility of formulating a new model of education which will be more suitable for the tamil context especially with tamil as medium of instruction and um, model that will lay adequate emphasis on tamil culture and history and also one that will address the question of social inequality caused especially by the caste society which has considerable impact on the institution of education also as a member of a subcommittee that deliberated on the rationale and philosophy of the new type of education that the tamil nadu government seeks to introduce in lieu of the national education policy 2020 i had proposed the tinai model as the one that will address all the major concerns of the project in other words the tinai model of education in my opinion is the truest and foundational representative of tamil culture and proven alternative to caste social order and indeed tamil will be the learning medium of this new model most importantly it will help end the forbidding anthropocene we are going through in a youtube presentation titled tamilaga kalvi kolgeyin thisai vali edu or what is the direction of the educational policy of tamil nadu which was made on tuesday 16th of may 2023 by professor roya murali the convener of the subcommittee in which i was a member he makes a reference to the tinai model of education i had proposed and describes it briefly from his comments on the model i presume that he agrees with me that it is the most suitable one for the tamil people but i would say that it is suitable not only for the tamil people but also for everybody because tinai was the pre holocene life way of all the people all over the world um a life way which is still in practice also 
among several primal or tribal people all over the world and will help end the Anthropocene. The Tamil people's claim over Tine is mainly due to the theorization and application of Tine theory in the early Tamil texts. But if we take Tine as our model for present day education, especially in Tamil Nadu, we need a theory which explicates the connection between the present situation and the ancient theory. As far as I know, no such theory of Tine is available today, except the one I formulated in the 80s, which I now call Puttine, meaning new Tine. In the 80s, I called it Oikopoetics, which has become part of the syllabi of departments of English and several academic institutions in India, and has also been a theoretical tool for many scholars in India and in other countries also. If we talk about a Tine based educational model for today, we will have to base it on Puttine. But tonight, I will focus only on education in pre state Tine and not on what type of education can be derived from that model. My engagement with the Tine model of education is traceable to what I might call the quest for indigeneity, not just in Tamil texts like Tolgapiyam but also in my own personal life, a quest which began some 50 years ago. The discussion groups, dialogue, and Indian knowledge systems I formed and convened in Chennai in the late 1970s were attempts to articulate the indigenous in my Tamil context. And in this, education was one important element. One of the street plays I scripted and directed and also acted in was about restoring indigenous architecture in Tamil Nadu through indigenous education. In the late 1970s, I realized that Tine was not a mere literary theory as it was understood by a majority of the Tamil scholars, but a way of life of the early Tamil people. Soon it dawned on me that Tine was in fact a way of life that was radically different from the contemporary industrialist way of life and that it could be the ideal alternative to the latter one. With this conviction, I convened a discussion group called Tine, which met in various places in Chennai from 1980 onwards, which uh, Mr. Randir you know, made a reference to in the beginning. The courses I taught at uh, Madras Krishnan College, Tamil Poetics, and Tamil musicology were also Tine based courses which explored the Tine life way. Yet another attempt I made in this direction was the writing of a paper to show how the 363 acre scrubland campus of Madras Christian College itself could be the text for students. This was followed by another paper in 1983 in which I argued that the educated person in the Tamil imagination was a sandron or a noble person. And in another paper of 1989, I tried to show how education was environmental in its orientation. Today, I would not qualify education with the adjective environmental because now I know better, I know that the concept of environment is problematic, which I did not know then. My chapter on Tine as an alternative life way was part of the textbook on value education, which came out in 1990. As this textbook was used by several colleges in the country, the idea of Tine as an alternative life way traveled widely, I think. This textbook not only made Tine a part of Indian value education, but also showed why Tine, an ideal indigenous life way, should not be ignored by Indian education. In 1991, I brought out a paper on value education because I was convening that program in Madras Christian College from the perspective of the Tamil Tine people. And in 1993, another one on an educational model, which I proposed as an alternative to the contemporary model of the industrial society. And I called that model uh, eco-regional education using the term eco-region as a synonym of Tine. 
Over the years, Tune has caught the imagination of the people, not only in Tamil Nadu and in some other states in this country, but also in other countries as well. But how is Tune understood by scholars? Most commonly, as I said earlier, it's only a literary theory, especially to Tamil teachers and scholars in the departments of Tamil in the academic institutions. But to the historians and Marxists, it is a thing of the past. In fact, nobody I had known until the 1980s understood Tine as a life way, especially as an alternative to the contemporary industrialist life way. Today, Tine has become a movement and those who promote this movement are engaged with one feature of Tine or another, but not with Tine as a whole, as an alternative life way. Therefore, the movement, which I call Tine, is in its infancy, and only when Tine life way becomes its core will the movement mature. One of the most important aspects of Tine life way is the Tine idea of the human. Today, we are quite comfortable with the idea that the human is a psychosomatic individual, a body mind complex, if you like, ontologically separate from the world, especially by virtue of the faculty of reason. This is particularly true of the Western thought system called liberal humanism, which forms the basis of our modern educational system. Such an idea is diametrically opposed to the idea of the human in Tine theory. In Tine, a human is a community, a home of which other humans and beings other than humans, including the supernatural ones, are members. In Tine, education helped the human to articulate what I might call communitarianness in the best possible manner. The four Tamil words for ancient Tamil education, and they tell us how communitarianness found best expression when people were educated. Those words are Kalvi, Kelvi, Vodal, and Chalbu. Kalvi is the commonest one. It is learning which requires constant effort on the part of the learner. Even as water springs up with more digging, knowledge results only with constant kalvi or learning. It involves learning skills and texts and training in the arts and crafts. The end of kalvi, of course, was learning to live in harmony with the community. Kelvi is oral learning, listening to the teachings of the masters. It enables the learner to memorize texts and acquire rhetorical skills. The end of Kelvi is perme or nobility, best expressed in humility. Wodal, another word, Tamil word for education, is recitative learning. Earlier, it meant repeating what one learned from a teacher. Later on, it has come to mean teaching itself. There was a great Tine poet named Wodalandayar. He could have been named so as he was famed for reciting several texts, probably. This evening, I want to focus on the fourth term, Salbu, which also meant education. Though this term is not commonly used for education, it encapsulates the Tine idea of education, I think, most effectively. The educated human was a communitarian being called Chandron, one who lived for the well being of the others, not necessarily one who invented or discovered or created something new. In Tine, even among ordinary people, we find Sandor. When Pari, a Sandon himself, died, his friend poet Kabilan said in his song, Morning Pari, that there were many Sandor in Pari's hill called Parambu. And that is why even when natural disasters overwhelmed the land, rains never failed and food was available in plenty. The poet Pisirandeya, who himself is lauded as a Sandron, tells us that the hair on his head had not grayed because 
of more than one reason. Because he was blessed with a virtuous wife and children, his helpers saw the world the way he did. His chieftain was the Indian who avoided evil and protected the people. And the fact that the residents among whom he lived in his wood or village were Sandro. Among all these, the last, the community of Sandro was really the secret of his youthful appearance. Now, what kind of education made these exemplars Sandro? First of all, their family, wherein the father played the major role in educating the child. Besides learning from family, the learner also learned from the kalam or acting area where he or she lived. As a child, the learner accompanied the elders who were foraging in the common land. Every action of the learner, perception or any other form of interaction with the natural features of the land, engendered meipadu or emotion and karutu or idea. The emotions and ideas with the guidance of the elders were properly oriented towards the ultimate ends, namely inbam or happiness, oral or substantiality and aram or ethicalness. Sandor also learned from other humans. One learned varaku or acceptable conventions at a given time and marabu or tradition that has been conserved for ages. For example, how a student had to conduct herself or himself in a learning context was varaku. Whereas the verses from Nigandu or a thesaurus like book the learner memorized enshrined marabu or the tradition with regard to language use. Tine people learned a lot from keen observation of nature and sustained familiarity, especially with beings other than humans. Students also learned both Mudal Nul or original text, as well as Vari Nul or commentaries or uh, Nigandu, which I mentioned, from teachers who specialized in those texts. In short, in Tine, one was shaped by family, one specific place, community, teacher, and the text. Each of these was contextual and required mental action like thinking, problem solving, and planning only to subserve or complement physical action. Evidently, education was a communitarian practice because humanness is possible, they thought, only in a community of which a human is a part, not outside the community. Every human is born into the community, which is interspecific, consisting of humans and beings other than humans. The world is available to humans and beings other than humans only as the community of which they are a part. And the human's consciousness of any entity is possible only within this community. The ancient sages Tamil sages called this community Tine. When humans interact with other humans and beings other than humans in the community I described above, consciousness plays a crucial role. Consciousness in the form of knowledge, which is a prominent role in education as we know, has to be understood as that which enables humans to be, shall I say, true Tine beings. Knowledge that disrupts communitarian being or living is harmful not only to humans, but also to beings other than humans. Therefore, being a community is synonymous with interacting with all members of the community with a view to articulating and conserving the interspecific community, especially by dwelling in the land. To say that one dwells in the land is to say, that one lives in a particular kalam, an acting area where one is located. This kalam has two aspects, the core, which is aham, which means the inner, and the periphery, which is the puram, which means the outer. If one is home, uh, one is uh, in his kalam. If one's home is aham, the commons around the home constitute the puram. One's kalam or acting area lay within 
one of the four primordial land areas, Mullay or scrubland, Kurinji or the mountain, Marudum or the riverine plain, and Nadal, the sea coast. According to Trinay theory, the entire surface of the earth is divided into these four primordial land areas. Along with these, a transitional fifth called Pale or the arid land is also a possibility. Each of these is a unique world with its own human groups and natural cultural features. For example, the Western Guards is an example of Kurinji Tine, in which there are several Tine communities like those of Mudugar, Kothar, Kurumbar, Todubar, Irular, Kani, and several others. Ultimately, it is possible to speak of five types of Tine or interspecific communities, each based on one of the five types of a land I mentioned just a while ago. The home or ill within Tine or the interspecific community consisted of such members as Tenbulatar, the ancestral spirit beings, Virundu, the guests, Wakkal, the kin, and the nuclear family of female parent and male parent. A harmonious interrelationship among these members was the ideal agam or home life in Tine. This home life was complemented by Puram life or life outside home. Life outside home involved the following, finding food from the land commonly held by all members of Tine, conserving the territory of one's home and guarding it from possible aggression or undue dominance, challenging exclusiveness or privatization of the common land, challenging the privileging of power over love in the conservation of Tine. To do all of these and defend it when there was dispute regarding it, one required an understanding of the Tine way of life. Harmonious home life was complemented by a normative Puram life, which involved dialogical interaction with community members in order to find energy for sustenance from the commons, conserve communitarian territoriality, commonness of wealth, ensure proper use of power, and hold on to one's ideological position firmly in the face of opposition. Such a harmonious life was the ultimate aim of Tine education. Education which made possible Tine life way was not yet institutionalized. There was no such thing as school as we know it today. Teachers there were, but they were not appointed by any body of authority. Standard testing patterns there were none, but education there was, which in my opinion was of much higher quality than what we have today. The teacher was known as Asri and Kanakayan and Asan, Asan, and the student was Manavan or Manakan. The student studied the real world and also texts which represented that world he or she inhabited. The text was Nul and Panuval. Work of art was Cheyur, which also meant art. Philosophy was known as Karchi, and logic was Aravai, Nayam, Tarukam and Vahe, each of which denoted a particular type of logic. Calculative thinking and mathematics were known as in, and writing, engraving, and painting were all denoted by the word Iritu. Like most primal people all over the world, Tamil Tine people were also inquisitive and observed their life place very carefully and were able to represent it in language and share their knowledge with others. Here is just one example. See how the poetess Kumari Nyadalar Napasalayar describes in her Tene song the breeding habit of the sea turtle. This passage occurs in an anthology called Akananuru. The female turtle, about to lay her eggs, walks ashore, digs a pit with her flippers lays eggs, covers those tusk-like white, round, meat-smelling eggs 
with sand and camouflages them with the creeper, which is called Adumbu in Tamil and Ipomia biloba by the scientists, the creeper which the turtle gathers from the shore. This amazingly accurate description of turtle behavior in a Tine song composed a few thousand years ago formed part of an essay that appeared in the Journal of Bombay Natural History Society in, in 1958, written by my senior colleague, Sanjeev Raj of the Department of Zoology in Madras Christian College. What is amazing about this natural history fact? Probably Napasalaya's account of the breeding habit of the sea turtle was known to other primal people of the world also but it was not known to modern science until the 17th century. Further, no modern scientist had known which plant material was used by the turtle to hide her eggs. Mawson, who described the breeding habit of the sea turtle in 1921, mentioned the use of sea weeds, but did not specify which plant. However, the poetess has intrigued modern scientists by saying, that it is the male turtle which sits on the eggs until they hatch. Now that was a problematic fact to Sanjeev Raj and his colleagues until the late 1950s, because such breeding behavior was not recorded by any modern scientist. Commenting on this scientific account in a love song, so Sanjeev Raj says that our ancients evinced keen interest in natural history. Now, I'd like to comment on this observation of his. In my view, the knowledge of turtle behavior was not a pursuit separable from the rest of the community life as it is with the academia today. Rather, such knowledge resulted from a way of life. What was common knowledge is a knowledge, uh, what was common knowledge in Tine remains mystery to modern scientists because Modern science is a knowledge domain, which has to be separated from one's everyday life if one really wants to be scientific and objective, whereas Tine is a life way. Napasalear is a Tine poetess who teaches us not only keen observation of nature, but also proper living. She shows how the family ought to collaborate to raise the family and enjoy togetherness. This involves a certain amount of suffering and pain also. The turtle parents are separated temporarily and it is hard for the family, but they unite once the babies are ready to take to the ocean. In this song, the turtle is not part of the human family because we humans are basically terrestrial animals, whereas the turtle is an aquatic friend. The turtles and the sea coast is part of the kalam or living area of the Nadal or coastal Tine people. Therefore, the Nadal Tine people would have looked upon turtles as their friends or guests rather than as family. The harmonious interaction of humans and turtles in their kalam is the heart of the matter, which I have named the Tine way of life. The particular song I brought to your attention speaks of the kinship particularly familial relationship among turtles, father turtle, mother turtle, and baby turtle. It also speaks of the relation between human lovers and compares the love relation between human lovers and a turtle family. It gives us insight into not only the home life of the animal, but also into how the animals make use of their puram or the common land in order to subsist and nurture the family. The friend-like relationship between the speaker and the turtle is both meta-rational and rational. The Tamil word wombum used in the song, which means will care for, shows two things. How the male turtle takes care of the eggs and how the speaker of the song has felt the feeling of the turtle in a meta-rational way. The male turtle is seen as a husband who cares for all the members of the family for whom he is the protector and hence the word kanavan, the same Tamil word uh, Tamil people use even today for a human husband. Both the description of the egg 
as that which is ivory-like and round and also smelling like meat is based on a different kind of relationship with the turtle, a rational one in which the turtle is an immediate other who is observed carefully like how a scientist would an object she studies. The visual and olfactory description is based on the color, texture, shape of the material of which the egg is made. The speaker does not describe the entire egg, only how it is perceived by someone who takes a close look at it. I do not want you to miss the fact that the speaker is able to see the turtle and other and addressee in her own karam, both meta-rationally and rationally. Now, how is she able to do this? Those who are familiar with the songs called Sangam anthologies will know that there are many such songs in these anthologies where we find graphic, realistic descriptions of the life world that Tine people inhabited. It is reasonable to attribute this ability of Tine people to observe keenly and describe it effectively for posterity to education rather than anything else. It's an ability to relate to the immediate other in a metal rational and rational way in a positively teleological manner. If so, it is not unreasonable to speculate that the speaker was one who was educated by her community in order to enjoy the kind of relationship I'm describing. The description of the turtle family contributes not only to evoking a picture of the place where human action is staged, but also to give a sense of the value orientation of the actions of the turtles and humans. The positively teleological action of the turtles gives rise to some emotions of which work your happiness is the predominant one. The arigay your sadness evoked at the destruction of the creeper and repugnance at the meat smell of the eggs are outweighed by the happiness evoked by the caring nature of the turtle husband. Similarly, the sadness and fear evoked by the manner of the chariot ride of the male human lover is balanced by the happiness that will result from the marriage of the human lovers. As the actions of both the animals and humans are oriented towards the positive ultimate ends, the emotions those actions evoke are also orchestrated teleologically positively. As the turtle husband and human husband have prioritized the well-being of the family over and above the convenience or pleasure of each, their actions will contribute to the happiness and good of the family of each. Such value orientation on the part of the agents, animal and human, is based on their intimate knowledge of their small world I have called Kala. When one is deeply interested in the well-being of the other in one's praxic life stage, one is likely to be observant and be sensitive to the needs of the other. Tine poets remind us of the fact that if emphasis is laid on living properly, knowledge would automatically ensue from such life way based on the three ultimate values based on love, happiness, substantiality, and ethicalness. As these are ultimate values, they are neither achievable by rational means nor reducible to experience despite being experienceable. Like economy, governance, art, and other domains in Tine, education was also oriented toward the ultimate values. By orienting itself to the ultimate ends, Tine education made a human into a sandron, especially Andri Avindri Atangiya Kwalhe Chandron. I will explain each of these Tamil terms. Making a sandron involved firstly providing deep knowledge, which the early Tamil people called Ahandra Arivu, a wide knowledge. Though the Tamil phrase Ahandra Arivu suggests wide width or breadth, it should not, I think, exclude depth also. Secondly, it taught the learner how to control his or her desires. The Tamil word is avidal, which literally means cooking something by boiling it. Cooking suggests the perception of the world is raw because it could give rise to all kinds of feelings and thoughts, both good and bad. 
Therefore, perception has to be cooked. It has to be reined in by the ultimate ends. Thirdly, making of a sound one involves teaching the learner humility, which is indicated by the Tamil word adangadal. A truly educated person is humble, humbled by whatever embodies the ultimate ends, in bum, or happiness, or by the highest values such as love and ethicalness. Consequently, the learner is taught to embrace a quality or position which will help her or him to live harmoniously with the community. The quality or position is at the same time graspable and not graspable. It is graspable because it amounts to adopting a position which behooves the learner to live for others. She or he grasps such a quality because the other Sandor upheld it and the community expects the Sandron, the learner, to do so. At the same time, such a kulhe is ungraspable because it is oriented towards the ultimate values, which are ultimately ungraspable. It is not easy to define the ultimate end. One knows what happiness is, what is more valuable in life, what ethicalness is only by virtue of being a member of a community, not in an analytic, definable way, but in, an, but in an undefinable emotional and spiritual way. What one calls conscience is not a purely individual sense, but a communitarian one. The ultimate test is not how the agent feels, but how all the members in the column of the agent feel about a certain action or event. This is why Tine education has to be always oriented towards the ultimate ends. If the definability of Kulge is based on bivalent logic, its undefinability is based on multivalent or fuzzy logic. The exclusively bivalent type of logic of Tine community was called Vahe, which involved argument and debate in which two opposite positions contested until one, one of them won over the other. In the Tamil state society, especially in the Bhakti period, this type of logic was employed in religious disputations, especially between Buddhists and Saivites or Jains and uh, Saivites and so on. Today, much of our life is based on the bivalent type of logic. According to the predominant type of Western logic modeled on the Aristotelian type, if P is true, not P has to be false. There cannot be a middle by which P can be both true and false at the same time. This law of thought is called the law of the excluded middle. But the Nayam logic of Tine does not rule out the middle always, though it does acknowledge that reality is and can be bivalent often. It concedes that if P is true, not P has to be false, but it does not exclude a situation when P could be both true and false if it fulfills the condition, namely the consequent good. Tirukural, a masterpiece that originated in the Tamil state society, exemplified the Nayam logic of Tine in the following couplet. This is couplet 291. If I could translate it, I would do so. If the end is faultless good, falsehood will also be assigned the place of truth. If the end is faultless good, falsehood will also be assigned the place of truth. Now, such a type of logic is positively teleological multivalence. However, such multivalence of Nayam has to be distinguished from relativism and postmodern indeterminacy, both of which are teleologically neutral. Nayam redeems itself from indeterminacy by virtue of its grounding in positive teleology. The ultimate ends of the Tnei people were also called Mumudalpur because they are ultimate ends of Payan on which the educated person's quality or position was based. Incidentally, Mumudalpur means three ultimate entities. Having a position or a worldview, such as living for others, gave the life of the Sandron a focus, nothing else like wealth or power could. Embracing an other-oriented life way was the culmination of the process of education, which involved 
imparting knowledge about Tene Life Way, equipping the learner with the necessary skills to live that life, cultivating positive feelings about that life way, and stealing the will to live that life even when it was not easy to do so. Without such education, my friends, Tine Life Way would certainly not have been possible. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Nirmal. As always, very, very deep. And uh, it is something which really talks about the alternative of modern education. And the way you uh, made us realize, in a sense, of how education is a communitarian praxis. And that is so deep, that is so deep, because uh, we are uh, living in a time where education is made for doing, I would say, some sort of organized crime because it is totally alienated. It is alienating us from nature or a sense of social or a sense of harmony. So this particular idea is very, very deep. Uh, in fact, uh, I was relating this idea with Ubuntu philosophy of Africa, uh, where uh, which uh, um, uh, a thrust is to leave I with a sense of we. And, and that is so, uh, you know, a healing in a sense of uh, understanding, I would say. So thank you so much for uh, giving a very deep presentation. And uh, I request a respected participant to also uh, participate in our dialogue section. So uh, with uh, uh, your kind permission, I would like to invite uh, Professor Gyan Gului to initiate the dialogue. And then we'll invite MD Chandraji, Gansyam Dasji, you know, yes. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was really impressive, and I am uh, I have taken many notices. Uh, well, I would be uh, very interested in the uh, in the question of education as communitarian process. This this interests me very much because I am dealing with some aspects of other cultures which says. Edu education is a communitarian process, and therefore I'm very much interested in this point. Uh, in particular, also uh, whether uh, there are limits which are imposed to the community in this process of education, or whether it is foreseen that anyway the individual has to make a process a part of the process for himself. Or uh, or not, and uh, anyway, I'm interested in the in the old concepts of of, uh, of education as a communitarian process, and therefore, if I would like to question to to ask whether something can be added on this point, because I I, I have the impression this is really a central point, and I am very much interested in it. Thank you very much. It was really very very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Randir, do you, would you like me to answer now, or uh, you can uh, take a note? Okay. Of these queries, and uh, uh, you can share your thought at the end of the session. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, I request uh, another friend to raise his or her hand, and then I'll be invite you. Maybe a minute, Pratanji. Hello, am I audible? Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank Professor Nirmal Salvamaniji. Uh, you know, as is, as usual and as always, it was like reading a book. I was uh, just mesmerized by the way it was been described. But I have one query that uh, whatever the models has been described through the Tennai model, we find that there is some relationship between, um, you know, many, if I talk that way, even in Odia also, that uh, old education has some principles of it. 
how they were teaching and what should be the life, way of life. So I just, I'm just curious to know whether it is based on the Vedanta philosophy or to be uh, the way of life. And the second query is, you know, why we were, we are, why it was not implemented into the modern education as a, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, MD Chandar Sahab. Actually, I'm not competent enough to ask questions, but for the Tinai model uh, up to school level only we had that uh, five Tinais only we know. Beyond that, I don't know anything. But now Tinai is a way of life that is very wonderfully explained by Professor Nirmal Kulomani. And I would like to go deep into his writings and uh, really I will share the thoughts to the younger generation. I'm old enough because 50 years before I read uh, only the five Tinais. <laughs> but it, it is a way of life. It is very wonderfully explained. Uh, I, I would like to explore more. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank you so much, Sanjeev. Thank you. Thank you. Engineer uh, Ansiam Dasi. And uh, he's taking some time. Maybe any other friend who would like to ask any question, please. Uh, as they are taking some time, so I request uh, Professor Nirmalji to help us with these queries. Um, did you say Nirmal? I mean, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Um, the first question is about the limits to uh, the communitarian praxis. Uh, thank you for that question. I think. Um, the, the important uh, limit should be uh, the orientation of the education uh, praxis, uh, orientation towards the ultimate ends, as I said. So that, I think, sets the boundary uh, limits to this education. As long as, you know, education, um, is oriented towards these ultimate ends, which in turn are based on love. I think um, that is the uh, limit of that education. Uh, also, um, we shouldn't forget that I've been emphasizing on the education of the immediate locus of the agent, the learner. Okay? So everything that you, I mean, want to learn everything that's worth learning. I think Tanay people believed could be learned from the locus one is placed in, one you know is located in. So uh, I don't know whether that answers your question. Um, the second question about implications for uh, modern education, um, I don't know, like this, uh, what I'm talking about, I, mean, uh, I made it clear, I think, that I'm only talking about how education was in the pre-state, uh, you know, times, uh, the, you know, in the ancient uh, Tamil world. Uh, I'm really not talking about an educational model which can be derived from that. That would be a very interesting topic. Of course, I'm interested in that too. So, um, but anyway, um, the model that I was describing is also somewhat similar to, you know, what we might call environmental education or what some people call place-based education today. You know, these are types of education which people experiment with, uh, mostly, you know, in the Western world. I think in a very small way, they are experimenting in India too. Uh, so, um, you know, these types of education, particularly place-based education, which was very much uh, inspired by the bioriginalist theory of uh, Peter Berg and uh, Raymond Gassman, uh, you know, is somewhat similar to 
uh, the model that I was describing, but they are certainly not the same. You know, they are very, very uh, different in many respects in very, um, uh, you know, in basic uh, ways, you know, they kind of diverge from Tine because they are not based on the Tine principles at all. Uh, so um, that's something that I would uh, mention. And if you're interested, uh, Ms. Minati, you might probably want to check out, you know, those types of education. Uh, thank you very much for the questions. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Yes, uh, Rahul Sarma uh, if wants to ask any question. Yes, Rahul Ji. No, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, one small query is, uh, you know, uh, with the advent of this new education policy, uh, we are talking so much about value-based education, means how we can uh, develop a kind of education which can orient uh, students towards society. And, uh, but the challenge that we are facing, you know, since education is a part of society's uh, intellectual infrastructure, but the market-based education, which uh, tries to force a student to be alienated to live life with a uh, sense of individual, not with society. So uh, because, uh, you know, uh, some uh, you are talking about a model of education of a society which is pre-modern in nature. Mm -hmm. So transition from modern to pre-modern how we can develop that orientation? You know, in that sense, we have to challenge the whole uh, capitalist uh, uh, apparatus in that sense to live with uh, need, not with greed. So how with that concept idea, you know, how we can develop or mold our education in that dimension, which can also challenge the market value you know, we are seeing the quest of environmental movement. We are seeing the quest of biodiversity. We can see the quest of sustainable development. But it is very difficult to challenge the whole orientation of our education towards that society. So how will you, uh, you know, whether that quest, you know, because we can see the uh, orientation towards cultural revitalization. But this idea is very, very, you know, uh, important. Whether we can, you can see that uh, uh, in future, whether you can see that change of orientation of education in that sense. Um, thank you, Mr. Randir. Um, I just want to repeat what I said a while ago. My talk was about the kind of education that prevailed in Tine. I was not talking about an educational model for today, but um, if we want to talk about, I mean, your question really is about, I think, a, a model for today or how the model that I was describing could kind of work today. Okay? Now, um, uh, that was not really part of my talk today, but since you asked this question, I would probably, you know, uh, think along those lines. Um, as I hinted at in my presentation, we somehow want to end this Anthropocene. Okay. If you're with me on that, then we need an education which will either contribute to the ending of it or which will be a part of the post-Anthropocene world. You know, that's the kind of education we need to be talking about. Now, uh, we don't want a, an educational model which will cater to the industrialist life way. The whole point is, is to end it and usher in a new era. That is what you know, I've been talking about the past 40 odd years. Uh, so, um, you know, 
we are we are reimagining a world. Uh, we are, you know, um, that world will have to, you know, have a different kind of economy, different kind of polity, different kind of uh, um, education also. So, <laughs> if uh, that new world <laughs> is an impossibility, the yeah. new kind of education that you know we are dreaming of will also be an impossibility. But I hope, like me, you don't want to think that these are impossibilities. We want to think that they are possible, and we need to work towards them. I think that is the which with which I was you know making this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So I request uh, Miniti Pradhan. Thank you very much. Hello. There is yes. some noise. Yes. Uh, what did I, I couldn't hear actually? Could you repeat repeat it, please? Uh, did you ask me to give the vote of thanks? Uh, yes. Yes. Offer vote of thanks. Okay. Thank you. I Minati Pradhan on behalf of Sadhya Sanchakra and Vishwanidam Center. Uh, I would like to thank our today's chief speaker, uh, Professor Nirmal Salvamani Sir, for his, as always, very beautiful presentation. And it is a great pleasure to learn from him. Thank you so much, sir. And I would like to thank uh, today, Professor Gyan Luigi, MD Chandar Sahab, and all the participants co present and learning and listening with us in our Zoom platform and in our Facebook platform. So thank you all. And uh, please pardon me if I've forgotten anybody's name. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Uh, we look forward for your kind participation in our coming dialogue also. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Nirmal Salvamani. It was very uh, interesting. Thank session. you. Thank you very much. I enjoyed being with you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.